In my previous video, I introduced viewers to the synoptic problem and surveyed four historically important solutions which have been proposed to explain the data. Two of these solutions presupposed that the Gospel of Mark was written first, while the other two preferred to think that Matthew was written first. It's safe to say that synoptic theories which depend upon the priority of Mark are clearly preferred in modern times. This is because the priority of Mark is taken to be the one thing which is virtually certain in synoptic studies. Even a cursory look at the literature will bear this out. Dang it. So it's just, just the, the absolutely fundamental thing here, absolutely fundamental thing is Mark and priority. Dennis and I agree, like the majority of scholars, that Matthew and Luke both had a copy of something that resembles our Gospel of Mark. Not exactly the same, but it must have been along those lines. This is so fundamental to so much good historical scholarship on the Gospels. And I, I, I've referred to it in writing before as one of the crown jewels in biblical studies scholarship. It's just one of those things which has enabled historians to get a whole fresh light on the historical Jesus, on the development of early Christianity. So that really fundamental thing we're agreed on. But what is the actual evidence for the priority of Mark? The confidence with which this dogma is held by modern scholarship would lead one to think that the evidence must be overwhelming and unassailable. This impression is strengthened by the long list of arguments for market priority, which can be confidently cited. However, when one looks beneath the surface, questions the status quo, and assesses the logic behind these arguments, they will discover that the case for market priority is far from airtight. This dogma was first historically accepted upon the basis of fallacy-riddled and unfalsifiable arguments, and when these problems were exposed, yet more problematic arguments were proposed right down to the modern day. Even Peter Head, a Markin priorist, admits as much, saying, Since the loss of confidence in many of the arguments that previous generations had used to establish Markin priority, new arguments have been actively sought by the scholarly community. Ever since Markin priority became the consensus view, at least from a historical perspective, much of synoptic research looks like a scramble to find ever more ingenious ways to prop up this idea. David Dungan makes this point rather memorably. It would seem that we live in the ironic situation where confidence in Markin priority rises to ever new heights, despite the fact that after 45 years of steady criticism, knowledgeable defenders of the hypothesis have been forced to abandon one basic argument after another to the point where there are, at present, no formal arguments left that will justify it, and the compositional arguments are just as questionable. It has rightly earned the sobriquet, the Teflon hypothesis. This video will critically assess the major arguments which have been cited to support the theory of Mark and priority, both in the past and in the present. One historically significant argument for Mark and priority comes from the pericope order within Mark's gospel. This argument was popularized by the English scholar B. H. Streeter, and while it was famously shown to be fallacious decades ago, it still turns up from time to time, especially among those scholars who do not specialize in the synoptic problem. As such, it is worth reviewing the argument, as well as its key weaknesses. The argument is based upon the fact that Mark's order of pericopes and events is generally also found in Matthew and Luke, and when either Matthew or Luke has an order which differs from Mark, then the other gospel usually follows Mark's order. Matthew and Luke only rarely agree together against Mark in their pericope order. From this phenomenon, Streeter inferred that Matthew and Luke must have used Mark, as they rarely agree in order against Mark's order. This argument proved persuasive to many scholars and, indeed, it proved instrumental in turning the tide of scholarship in favor of Mark and priority. In reality, however, the argument does nothing more than to establish that Mark is the middle term between Matthew and Luke. Either Matthew and Luke have chosen to follow Mark's order except for when they disagree with him, or else Mark has chosen to follow Matthew's order in some instances and Luke's order in others. In short, the argument demonstrates that dependency exists among the three synoptics and that Mark has to be either first or last, but it does not and cannot indicate the direction of dependency. For this reason, arguments from order cannot establish the priority of Mark. The argument is guilty of what has become known as the Lackman fallacy. As Ward Powers says, there is no doubt that the evidence is completely in accord with and is explained by Mark and priority but it is completely incorrect to think that Mark and priority is the only way to explain the evidence. 
In fact, the evidence is consistent with all four of the major theories of literary interrelationship and of the numerous variations on these that have been proposed. Certainly, these are not arguments for Markan priority against Markan dependence because they equally support the Markan dependence hypothesis. Back in 1951, the English scholar B.C. Butler gave a refutation of Streeter's argument as entire as has ever been offered since. And due to the historical importance of his critique of Streeter, as well as his eminent flair, I quote Butler at some length here. On the basis of this accurate statement of highly important data, Streeter inferred, following in the wake of a distinguished line of critics and himself not the last in the ranks, rests an inference which is obviously false. Since the argument conceals a schoolboyish error of elementary reasoning at the very base of the two-document hypothesis, as commonly proposed for our acceptance, we may be forgiven for devoting to its refutation more space than it intrinsically deserves. The deduction to be drawn from these facts is no longer that Mark contains the whole of a document, which Matthew and Luke have independently used, but that there is a relation of dependence, one way or the other, between Matthew and Mark, and again between Mark and Luke. Is it too much to hope that the Lachman fallacy will no longer be displayed, with every appearance of superior logic, before the imagination of an unsuspecting public, prone to submit to the claim to reason and slow to examine its validity? The cantina of authors listed above as propagating this fallacy should at least suggest a doubt whether the present dominance of the theory of Mark and priority is really due, as is commonly supposed, to a triumph of honest criticism over traditionalism and fantasy. Another once popular argument for the priority of Mark comes from the presence of Semitisms, or distinctively Jewish words, in the text of Mark. The assumption is that Semitisms indicate temporal priority in view of the fact that Jesus was Jewish, and so Semitisms represent words which were most likely original to Jesus. Further, it assumes that later Christian writers would have been motivated to reduce the number of Semitisms in their writings in order to appeal to the increasing number of Gentile Christians. W. D. Davies and Dale Allison ask us, How then do proponents of Matthaean priority account for the six Semitic expressions found in Mark but not in Matthew? In the first place, even if we grant, for the sake of argument, that Christians writing to Gentile audiences would have been motivated to reduce the number of Semitisms in any given gospel, there is no obvious reason to think that Semitisms necessarily indicate temporal priority, because we don't know exactly who the original audience of any particular gospel might have been. It is entirely possible for a later document to be written for a substantially more Jewish Christian community, and therefore to include additional Semitisms. But more than this, it is doubtful that Matthew and Luke really do exhibit a desire to include fewer Semitisms than Mark. Matthew in particular tends to have much more of an eye towards Jewish interests than the other synoptics, suggesting that he may have had a substantially Jewish audience. Ward Powers sums things up nicely. It is as valid to argue that Mark changed Matthew's Greek to his preferred style, or in order to reflect Peter's use of such Semitisms in his preaching, as that Matthew changed it the other way. We seem to be dealing here with the personal preferences of an author rather than a decisive proof of relative antiquity. Moreover, the evidence concerning Semitisms in general indicates that Matthew has the highest level of Semitisms in the New Testament, followed by Luke, while Mark has only about 55% as many as Matthew. It is thus very difficult to argue that Matthew and Luke had the redactional tendency of avoiding Semitisms. One newer argument for the priority of Mark comes from the supposed lower Christology present within the Gospel of Mark compared to the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. Examples such as Jesus' supposed inability to perform miracles in Mark 6.5 or his alleged denial of his own deity in Mark 10.18 are used to motivate this line of reasoning. Had Matthew and Luke been using Mark, so the argument goes, it is easy to explain why they would change some of Mark's statements about Jesus, which make him look less divine, in light of the ever-increasing reverence Christians had for Jesus, as they began to view him as divine. Conversely, had Mark been using Matthew and Luke, it's very difficult to see why Mark would make their more divine view of Jesus more human. This argument hinges on two dubious assumptions. In the first place, it assumes that belief in Jesus' deity evolved over time and was not present from the very inception of Christianity. In the second place, 
it assumes that Mark actually does portray Jesus as being less divine than Matthew and Luke, but these assumptions are far from certain. First, the idea that divine Christology evolved later on in the history of Christianity is demonstrably false. By all accounts, the writings of the Apostle Paul predate the Gospel of Mark, and yet in Paul, we see clearly that Christians already regarded Jesus as fully divine before Mark ever wrote his Gospel. 1 Corinthians 8.6 says, Yet for us there is only one God, the Father, from whom are all things, and we exist for him, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we exist through him. Romans 9.5 says, And from whom is the Christ, according to the flesh, who is over all, God, blessed forever. Amen. Colossians 1.15-20 says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is also the head of the body, the church, and he is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he himself will come to have first place in everything. For it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in him, and through him, to reconcile all things to himself. As Richard Baucom has famously said, the earliest Christology was already the highest Christology. So the assumption that divine Christology was a later development within Christianity is clearly and seriously flawed, meaning that even if Mark does demonstrate a lower Christology than the other synoptics, this cannot be taken to indicate that his gospel is any earlier than theirs. If anything, this would be evidence that Mark was written later, since all of the evidence suggests that lower Christology rather than higher Christology was a later development. But is it even true that Mark has a lower Christology than Matthew and Luke? Let's take a look at the two most popular examples where Matthew allegedly redacted Mark to reflect a higher Christology. A favorite example is Mark 6, 5-6, which reads, And he could not do any miracle there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them, and he was amazed at their unbelief. Whereas the parallel in Matthew 13, 58 says, and he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Peter Head sees support for Mark in priority here, saying, This passage has often been cited in connection with the Christological argument for Mark in priority because of the difference between Mark's statement, he could do no mighty works there, and he marveled because of their unbelief, which suggests that Jesus was unable to perform miracles in Nazareth, and Matthew's, he did not do many mighty works there. But is this really what Mark intended to convey when he said that Jesus could not do many mighty works there? Did Mark really believe that people's faith somehow gave Jesus the ability to do miracles? A careful reading of Mark's gospel will clearly yield a negative answer to these questions. Consider the story of the healing of the paralytic in Mark 2, 3-12. And some people came, bringing to him a man who was paralyzed. And Jesus, seeing their faith, said to the paralyzed man, Son, your sins are forgiven. But some of the scribes were sitting there and thinking it over in their hearts. Why does this man speak that way? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins except God alone? Immediately Jesus, aware in his spirit that they were thinking that way within themselves, said to them, Why are you thinking about these things in your hearts? Which is easier, to say to the paralyzed man, Your sins are forgiven? Or to say, Get up and pick up your pallet and walk? But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralyzed man, I say to you, get up, pick up your pallet, and go home. And he got up and immediately picked up the pallet and went out in the sight of everyone. Several relevant facts follow from a careful reading of this passage. First, we see a theme in Mark that Jesus chooses to heal those who first have faith. Second, we see that Jesus has the ability to forgive sins, which is evidence of his deity. And third, we see that Jesus has the ability to heal the man as proof of his deity. As Sigurd Grindheim argues, In the forgiveness sayings of Mark 2, 5, and 10, with their focus upon the earthly authority of Jesus, Jesus took upon himself a role that was known as the prerogative of God himself. Unlike others in the early Christian community, Jesus did not refer beyond himself to warrant his authority. 
His authority was demonstrated by his own act of healing. The best explanation for Jesus' acts is that he understood himself to have an authority that in a Jewish context was exclusively attributed to God. Jesus appears to have put himself in a role that was reserved for God and thus implicitly claimed to be God's equal. Thus, Mark very clearly regards Jesus as divine, endowed with authority from God, and capable of proving this through miracles. If Head is correct in how he is interpreting Mark 6, Mark is completely contradicting everything which he told us about Jesus in Mark 2. If instead we choose to read Mark 6 through the lens of what Mark already told us in Mark 2, this allows Mark to be consistent with his own Christology. We see that Jesus was only unable to heal many people in Nazareth because he had chosen to do miracles on the condition of faith, and that condition was not being met. Craig Evans is a Markan Priorist who uses Christological arguments for Markan Priority and is perfectly willing to say that Matthew and Luke improved Mark's Christology. Yet even he acknowledges that there is no intention on Mark's part to paint Jesus as genuinely lacking the ability to do miracles in Nazareth in this passage. Regarding this verse, he says, Did Jesus choose not to do miracles here, or was he unable to do so? Being the Son of God... Jesus could do miracles when he chose to do so, but he would not heal anyone who did not believe in him. Therefore, it is appropriate to say that Jesus was unable to heal many because there were so few who believed. This is also clear in Mark 6.6, 6, and he was amazed at their unbelief. Matthew and Mark are making the same point. In sum, we can only read Mark as suggesting that Jesus was literally lacking the ability to do miracles in Nazareth, if we read Mark 6-5 in exclusion of everything else which Mark tells us about Jesus' divine power and authority. To the extent that we accept that, taken in isolation from the rest of Mark's gospel, this verse makes it look like Jesus was less powerful than Matthew does, we may say that Mark may have been careless with his word choice here. For as we have already seen, Mark clearly regarded Jesus as divine and possessing the ability to heal the sick. Consequently, he could not have intended to convey any inability on Jesus' part in Mark 6.5. If that is the unintentional effect of this verse, this is to be explained by recourse to Mark's carelessness. But there is no reason to suppose that Mark would have been less careless had he been dependent upon Matthew here. So, in fact, Mark 6.5 tells us nothing whatsoever about the priority of Mark. Perhaps the favorite text of proponents of Christological arguments for Mark and priority is Mark 10.18. The verse reads, But Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. But in Matthew 19.17 we read, And he said to him, Why are you asking me about what is good? There is only one who is good. From this, Peter Head argues that, Matthew alters Mark's text with a view to correcting, or at least protecting from possible misunderstanding, the implicit suggestion in Mark's potentially embarrassing account that Jesus is not good and not God. As we have already seen in our consideration of Mark 2, the author of Mark's gospel clearly regards Jesus as being God. Consequently, he cannot be intending to have Jesus deny his own deity in Mark 10.18, and in fact, a careful reading of the text demonstrates that Jesus cannot be denying his own deity since he is asking a question rather than making a declarative statement. As Brant Petrie observes, First and foremost, Jesus does not deny that he himself is good. He does not say, I am not good. If he had said this, we would have to admit that he did not regard himself as God. Yet all Jesus affirms is that there is only one who is truly good, God. Jesus uses questions and riddles to lead his audience into the mystery of who he is. In the case of the rich young man, Jesus poses a question that is meant to lead the young man to follow out the implications of his own words. If Jesus is good, and God alone is good, then who exactly is Jesus? Jesus ends by telling the rich young man that the one thing he still lacks is to sell all he has and follow him. This ending is essential for unlocking the riddle of his words yet it is constantly overlooked by those who claim that Jesus is denying that he is God. After making this declaration about the goodness of God, Jesus does something stunning. He adds a command to follow him to the obligation to keep the Ten Commandments. Here is Jesus adding the command to follow him as if that was on par with keeping the commandments. 
When we interpret the story of Jesus and the rich young man in its first century context, we discover that the passage most frequently used to argue that Jesus does not claim to be divine, upon closer inspection, turns out to be powerful evidence that Jesus does claim to be God. If Petrie is right, then the Christological argument for Mark and priority depends upon a superficial comparison of Matthew 19.17 and Mark 10.18. This again fundamentally misunderstands Mark by wrenching a single verse out of the larger context to try to make Mark portray Jesus as being less than divine. But a careful reading of Mark cannot sustain this interpretation. We must never miss the forest for the trees when comparing particular passages of the Synoptic Gospels. Mark portrays Jesus as being, in every sense, just as divine as the other synoptic gospels. There is a troublesome unfalsifiability to many arguments for Mark in priority. Consider that Mark's supposed mistakes and his accuracy, as well as Matthew's supposed mistakes and his accuracy, are both taken to be evidence for the priority of Mark. G.M. Styler is representative of this contradictory sort of thinking among Mark and priorists. Of all the arguments for the priority of Mark, the strongest is that based on the freshness and circumstantial character of his narrative. In effect, the suggestion amounts to the view that Mark had direct access to what was in fact Matthew's ultimate source, to the authentic version of the story, which Matthew has often abbreviated or modified. And yet, just a few pages earlier, Styler said, In fact, the relative roughness of Mark is one of the strongest arguments on the other side, in textual criticism, it is accepted that, all other things being equal, the harder reading is to be preferred, since it is more probable that the harder should have been altered to the easier than vice versa. Numerous examples can be produced in which, in one way or another, Matthew's version looks easier than Mark's. Mark Goodacre makes a similar sort of mistake, saying in one place, it is with Mark's gospel that we are afforded a brief glimpse into a slightly more gritty, more realistic picture of Jesus. And then just a few pages later, whereas Mark calls Herod Antipas king four times in the passage, Matthew more correctly has tetrarch, precision which is typical of Matthew. Matthew is working from his Mark and source, making characteristic changes. In short, when Mark gets the details right, this is taken as evidence that Mark was first. But when Mark gets details wrong, this is also taken as evidence that Mark was first. When Matthew gets details right, he must be correcting Mark because Mark was first. When Matthew gets details wrong, it must be because he strayed from Mark who was first. When Matthew gets details right, it must be because he was correcting Mark. Ward Powers is correct when he says, To consider the implications of these last two arguments, when Mark is wrong and Matthew and Luke do not contain the mistake, this proves Mark in priority. But when Matthew or Luke is wrong and Mark does not contain the mistake, this proves Mark in priority. But when Mark has a better structure and context than Matthew or Luke, this proves Mark in priority. And then when Matthew or Luke has a better structure or context than Mark, this proves Mark in priority. What sort of argument is that? With so many of the historically prominent arguments for Mark in priority being based upon such manifestly fallacious reasoning, and with neo griesbachian scholars pointing out this inconvenient fact throughout the last half of the 20th century, there has become a need for new arguments to sustain Mark and priority. No one has dedicated themselves to this task more fervently, nor more creatively, than Mark Goodacre. While Goodacre departs from the still-dominant two-source hypothesis, his own fairer golder hypothesis retains the idea that Mark was the first gospel. I think it is safe to say that Goodacre is, by far, the most formidable defender of the priority of Mark in the modern age. As such, I shall devote a lot of space to discussing his arguments. Goodacre refers to his first argument as the argument from additions and omissions. This argument begins by considering the synoptic material that is unique to Mark, as well as the material which does not appear in Mark. It then asks if it is more plausible that the unique material was added by Mark, or omitted by the other synoptic authors, and whether it is more plausible that the material which is absent from Mark was more likely deliberately omitted by Mark, or unknown or unavailable to Mark. Supposedly, when this is done, it's supposed to strike one as more plausible that some of the unique material in Mark, such as Jesus healing with spit, or Jesus being belittled by his own family, or the unidentified naked man in the Garden of Gethsemane, 
is unlikely to have been added by Mark as supplementary material. Likewise, it's supposed to strike one as more plausible that Matthew and Luke contain material which Mark would have never deliberately omitted if it had been available to him, such as the birth narratives, the Sermon on the Mount, or the resurrection appearances. As Goodacre explains, Mark's gospel is considerably shorter than both Matthew and Luke. One of the most pressing issues, therefore, for adherents of the Griesbach hypothesis is to provide an account for why Mark omitted the material their theory dictates that he omitted. Furthermore, this needs to be studied alongside the additions Mark allegedly makes, and some account of the relationship between the omissions and additions will be necessary. There are several reasons for thinking that Mark and Priority, and the theory of mutual omission by Matthew and Luke, is the more plausible. There are common elements in the healing of the deaf mute and the blind man of Bethsaida that might straightforwardly explain the omission. First, both healings involve the use of saliva. Second, both healings involve the element of secrecy that is so often standard in Mark. Furthermore, the healing of the blind man of Bethsaida clearly places some kind of limit on Jesus' ability. The healing is not instantaneous, but takes time. Goodacre approvingly cites W.D. Davies and Dale Allison as they ask, Can one seriously envision someone rewriting Matthew and Luke so as to omit the miraculous birth of Jesus, the Sermon on the Mount, and the resurrection appearances, while on the other hand adding the tale of the naked young man, a healing miracle in which Jesus has trouble healing, and the remark that Jesus' family thought him mad? Mark's additions can be explained easily enough on the hypothesis that he was writing third. After all, according to church tradition, Mark had the Apostle Peter as his source of information. His remarks regarding the naked man, Jesus' use of saliva, and Jesus' family can all be explained by his supplementing Matthew and Luke with his recollections from Peter. Moreover, the suggestion that Jesus healing the blind man twice in Mark 8.23 implies a lack of power on Jesus' part is dubious. As we have already noted, Mark has a high Christology. More likely, this two-stage healing is intended to function as foreshadowing of Peter's partial understanding of Jesus, which only came to fullness after Jesus' death and resurrection. As David Peabody and his co-authors suggest, the partial restoration of this man's sight may anticipate the next pericope in Mark's Gospel, where Peter sees only in part, more will be required for Peter to attain clear vision. But what about all the material which Mark leaves out? Why would Mark have failed to include the birth story, the Sermon on the Mount, or the resurrection appearances? Wouldn't Mark clearly wish to include this? The major problem with this argument lies in the gratuitous assumption that Mark is intended to be a gospel of the same type as Matthew and Luke. If that were the case, then it would indeed be unexpected that Mark would leave out these details pertaining to Jesus' birth, ministry, and resurrection, had they been available to him. But are we really to imagine that the author of Mark didn't know about Jesus' post-resurrection appearances? This seems to me wholly implausible because, first, the author is clearly a Christian, and we know that the Christian community believed in the resurrection appearances, and second, the young man at the tomb in Mark 16.7 predicts that the appearances of Jesus are going to occur shortly. So if we instead accept that the author of Mark did know about the resurrection appearances of Jesus, as I think we must, then it is indeed puzzling as to why he does not include them in his gospel. But notice that this puzzle remains even if Mark was written first. And this, in turn, challenges the notion that the puzzle can be used to support Mark in priority. For whether prior or posterior, the mystery of why Mark left out the resurrection appearances remains. This fact should tip us off that whatever other purposes Mark may have had in composing his gospel, one of them was not to give a complete story of the life of Jesus. This, therefore, undermines the central assumption which undergirds the argument from additions and omissions. Mark is not the same type of gospel as Matthew and Luke. Matthew and Luke constitute early Christian didache, that is, teaching for those who were within the faith community and wanted to know more about Jesus. By contrast, the Gospel of Mark is probably early Christian kerygma, that is, a proclamation of the Gospel for unbelievers. This distinction is vital because it explains why Mark is shorter and omits so much material in view of the fact that it was intended to be preached to non-Christians 
who likely wouldn't be willing to dedicate as much time to hearing about Jesus, and who would not be as curious about the details of Jesus' birth or his believer-specific teachings, such as the Sermon on the Mount. Ward Powers argues, Why is this significant? The conclusion we have reached regarding Mark's purpose, from an examination of the material that he has chosen to include in its arrangement and wording, is that Mark did not write for the church at all, that is, not as it were, for the church's internal use. He produced a book for the church's external use. He put a source book for the church's kerygma into the hands of the church's evangelists. The Gospels of Matthew and Luke contain the needed kerygma material, but they contain a great deal of other material as well. Moreover, each has relevant pericopes that the other does not. To make copies of both Gospels is a lengthy and expensive business. To make a copy even of one is to copy more than is required for the kerygma. The church needed a book containing the kerygma extracted from both Matthew and Luke. This was considerably cheaper to produce and considerably easier to use. There is, therefore, a clear motive available for the production of Mark's gospel when the others were in existence, to provide a special purpose gospel containing in clear consecutive fashion the kerygma of the church extracted from Matthew and Luke for use in evangelism. This answers the irrelevancy argument against Mark independence. In passing, it's worth noting that this explanation also pacifies the long-standing argument for Mark and priority based upon Mark's more casual grammar. For if the intention of his gospel was to be preached, then it would often be read orally, and as such, it makes sense that Mark would adapt his wording to be easily read aloud. Therefore, neither Mark's unique material, nor his omissions, nor even his language support the theory of Mark and priority. Perhaps the most ingenious new argument developed for Mark and Priority is the argument from editorial fatigue, spearheaded by Mark Goodacre. Goodacre defines editorial fatigue as follows. Editorial fatigue is a phenomenon that will inevitably occur when a writer is heavily dependent on another's work. In telling the same story as his predecessor, a writer makes changes in the early stages which he is unable to sustain throughout. Like continuity errors in film and television, examples of fatigue will be unconscious mistakes, small errors of detail, which naturally arise in the course of constructing a narrative. They are interesting because they can betray an author's hand, most particularly in revealing to us the identity of his sources. So the idea is that Matthew and Luke possess continuity errors within themselves. These continuity errors, it is argued, are explained by Matthew and Luke making deliberate changes to details in Mark early on in their versions of the same story, and then forgetting that they did this. Thus, they end up copying the original details into their version of the story later on, and thereby create some level of inconsistency or confusion in the final story. Goodacre gives the example of the cleansing of the leper. In Mark, Jesus tells the leper, See that you say nothing to anyone, but go show yourself to the priest. In Matthew's version of the story, Prior to the healing of the leper, Matthew adds the fact that crowds were following Jesus. When Jesus came down from the mountain, large crowds followed him. Yet, after healing the leper, Matthew follows Mark's wording by having Jesus say to the leper that he has just healed, See that you tell no one, but go show yourself to the priest. From this, Goodacre argues, In Matthew's version of the story, there are two elements that are difficult to reconcile many crowds at the beginning of the narrative, and the charge, see that you say nothing to anyone at the end of it. A miracle that has been witnessed by many is apparently to be kept secret. This is in contrast to Mark, where there are no crowds. The Mark and leper meets Jesus privately, and the command of silence is coherent. This odd state of affairs can be explained by the theory of Mark in priority, for which it is therefore evidence. The first major problem with this argument is that it is debatable that the alleged examples of inconsistencies cited by Goodacre in order to motivate the argument are actually inconsistencies at all. In this particular example, we may begin by observing that Goodacre's conclusion rests completely upon the disputed idea that Matthew 8.1 constitutes the beginning of the story of Jesus cleansing the leper, as opposed to the end of the story of the Sermon on the Mount. If Matthew 8.1 is simply the end of the story from chapter 7, 
then there is clearly no inconsistency between Matthew 8.1 and 8.4, and consequently Goodacre's argument cannot even get off the ground. As David Neville argues, On the basis of this observation, one might infer that Matthew's version of the story is secondary because he incorporated source material, namely the command to secrecy, that did not fit neatly into his narrative framework. However, as noted above, this judgment depends on whether one reads Matthew 8.1 as Matthew's introduction to this pericope or as part of his conclusion to the Sermon on the Mount. But let us suppose that Goodacre is correct about Matthew 8.1 and 8.4 being part of the same pericope. Is there any reason to suppose that there is a genuine continuity error in this text? The first thing to note is that Mark's failure to mention a crowd in no way supports Goodacre's claim that the leper met Jesus privately in Mark's gospel. So there doesn't have to be any disagreement between Mark and Matthew in that regard. And what of the supposed inconsistency? Goodacre's argument wholly rests on there being a genuine difficulty believing that a crowd was present when Jesus told the leper to tell no one that he had been healed. But a little reflection will show that there is not any difficulty here at all. In Mark 7, 32-37, there is a similar story where Jesus heals a deaf and mute man in front of a multitude and tells the entire multitude not to tell anyone what he has done. Is it so difficult to imagine that something similar happened in Matthew 8? Couldn't Jesus have likewise told the crowds not to tell anyone what had happened? Clearly, according to Mark 7, Jesus himself had no problem with healing in front of crowds and then asking the entire crowd to keep the healing a secret. So unless Goodacre wants to maintain that Mark 7 is also inconsistent, then he must abandon Matthew 8 as being genuinely inconsistent, and therefore he must reject it as being a genuine example of editorial fatigue. Goodacre is also fond of the story of John the Baptist's beheading. The story in Mark is that Herodias wants to kill John because she has a grudge against him, but she could not because Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, she was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. In Matthew's version of the story, this element has dropped out. Now it is Herod and not Herodias who wants him killed. When Mark then speaks of Herod's grief at the request for John's head, it is coherent and understandable. Herodias demanded something that Herod did not want. But when Matthew, in parallel, speaks of the king's grief, it makes no sense at all. Matthew had told us, after all, that Herod wanted to put him to death. The obvious explanation for the inconsistencies of Matthew's account is that he is working from a source. He has made changes in the early stages, which he fails to sustain throughout, thus betraying his knowledge of Mark. This is particularly plausible when one notes that Matthew's account is considerably shorter than Mark's. Matthew has overlooked important details in the act of abbreviating. But again, there does not have to be a contradiction between Matthew and Mark here. Although Matthew does not mention Herodias in his version of the story, nothing he says precludes her from having moved Herod to kill John the Baptist. And regarding Matthew's supposed inconsistency, there is simply no contradiction between saying that Herod wanted to kill John and that he was also sorry to do so. This is simply the well-known distinction between an antecedent and a consequent desire. An antecedent desire is that which considers a thing in and of itself detached from its particular circumstances or consequences. A consequent desire is that which considers a thing as well as its circumstances and consequences. A familiar example of this distinction comes from the everyday experience of rising in the morning and both wanting to go to work as well as not wanting to go to work. Antecedently, we do not want to go to work because we have other things that we would rather be doing. However, as a result of considering the consequences of not going to work, we consequently do want to go to work. With this distinction in mind, it seems clear to me that this is what Matthew means when he describes Herod as both wanting to kill John and as sad that he had to do it. I believe that Goodacre incorrectly identifies Mark's reference to Herod enjoying John's preaching as being the reason why Herod was sad when the time came to kill John. In fact, the reason Mark gives for Herod's reluctance is fear of knowing that John was a righteous and holy man. This is fully harmonious with Matthew's account, which states that Herod was afraid to kill John because he knew that the people regarded him as a prophet. Both accounts present a consistent story. 
Herod arrested John at the instigation of Herodias. He antecedently wanted to execute John for speaking out against him despite enjoying his preaching, yet he was consequently afraid to do so because he feared the people who regarded John as a prophet due to his upstanding character. I see no need to suggest that Matthew is changing things within Mark. Rather, I see both stories as being consistent, but with Mark providing some additional details which give us a fuller picture of what was going on. Another supposed example of editorial fatigue is found in the story of Jesus calming the storm. While Goodacre does not use this example, his colleague Joel Marcus does, saying, Matthew likes earthquakes. He takes over Mark's story about the stilling of the storm, but changes Mark's sudden tempest into an earthquake in the sea. While meteorologically possible, the description here is in some tension with the rest of the narrative, which just speaks of Jesus rebuking the winds and of the disciples exclaiming about the effect of this rebuke on the winds and the sea, not the earth. So Marcus's contention is that Matthew is inconsistent with himself by saying that an earthquake arose in the sea, causing the water to become turbulent, but later saying that Jesus restores peace by rebuking the wind. This inconsistency can be easily explained if we suppose that Matthew has switched out Mark's description of a windstorm for an earthquake, forgotten that he has done this by the end of the story, and consequently ends up contradicting himself. Truly, this is a conflict of Marcus' own making. In saying that the turbulence was caused by an earthquake, Matthew does not thereby deny that winds were also present. There is no tension, let alone a contradiction, entailed by saying that the turbulence was caused both by an earthquake and also by the wind. These events are mutually compatible with one another. Consequently, there is no incoherence within Matthew's narrative, and therefore no reason to suppose that this is another example of editorial fatigue. As David Neville observes, what early reader or hearer of Matthew's version of this episode would not have associated strong winds with a quake in the sea and a boat being hidden by waves? If, as suggested above, Matthew was aware of the parallels between this pericope and Jonah 1, there is no need to posit overzealous abbreviation of Mark's account to explain Matthew's failure to mention the wind in Matthew 8.24. As a result, little source-critical weight can be attached to this alleged inconsinity. While I have only offered a detailed analysis of two of Goodacre's examples and a third popular example, similar harmonizations are available for other alleged examples of editorial fatigue. The point is simply that the argument is unmotivated for those who don't accept that there are necessarily examples of inconsistencies within and among the synoptic gospels. Minimally, Goodacre and his followers have not provided any reason to think that this hypothesis is more likely correct than the harmonizations which I have proposed. The second major problem with the argument from editorial fatigue is that it assumes that the gospel authors felt free to deliberately alter the facts. But this is an assumption which is questionable and runs contrary to a prima facie reading of the Gospels which present themselves as honest historical reportage. There is not sufficient evidence to justify the claim that the Gospel authors felt free to deliberately alter the facts. As Lydia McGrew states at the end of her lengthy study of this topic, there is simply no good evidence that suggests that the evangelists thought of themselves as licensed to invent, and there is a wealth of evidence to the contrary. This evidence, too, will remain to be accounted for, even if some new specific fictionalization theory arises. We need not and should not qualify and confuse this message by saying that the authors sometimes considered themselves licensed to change the facts. The third problem is that even if we accept, for the sake of argument, that the gospel authors were making deliberate changes to facts and creating inconsistencies, the phenomenon of inconsistencies can be interpreted the other way around. In other words, instead of viewing Matthew and Luke as creating inconsistencies by forgetting the changes which they made to Mark, one could just as easily interpret Mark as fixing inconsistencies within Matthew and Luke. This means that the phenomenon of inconsistencies cannot tell us anything about the order in which the Gospels were composed. At best, it shows that Mark is the middle term between Matthew and Luke in some way. Remember, Editorial fatigue is an interpretation of the supposed phenomenon we are considering. The phenomenon itself is just alleged incongruity within the synoptics, but there is more than one way to interpret this kind of incongruity. 
Goodacre needs to show that his interpretation of the phenomenon of incongruity is more likely correct than any other. In passing, it's worth pointing out that there is a certain unfalsifiability to Goodacre's arguments for Markin priority. As Powers somewhat humorously observes, Goodacre compares Mark's harder readings with Matthew and Luke, since the way they smooth his roughness and correct his errors supposedly indicates that they were subsequent to Mark. Thus, when Matthew and or Luke has something that apparently makes better sense than Mark's version, this points to Mark in priority. Also, Goodacre claims that both Matthew and Luke suffer quite a bit from editorial fatigue and forget where they are and when they are copying from Mark. Goodacre believes that these elements indicate that Matthew and Luke were working from a source, that is, Mark. Thus, when Mark's material makes better sense than Matthew's and or Luke's, this also points to Mark in priority. So whichever way the situation goes, the explanation is Mark in priority. For those attempting to prove Mark in priority and disprove Mark in posteriority, such evidence is always on their side. Heads I win, tails you lose. In this video, we have surveyed several of the most historically prominent and currently popular arguments for the priority of Mark's gospel. The aim was to show that the case for Mark and priority has been vastly overstated and that the evidential foundation of this dogma is wholly inadequate. This, of course, is no proof that the Gospel of Matthew is written first or that the Gospel of Mark was written third. We shall explore the external and internal evidence for these conclusions in two future videos. The only conclusion we have reached here is that there is no justification to be had for the theory of Mark and priority, despite the confidence with which it is widely held. However, it is my hope that this video serves to clear away some of the bias and prejudice against the patristics and motivates us to take what they have to say about the Synoptic Gospels more seriously.